my concerns that I have, even on a day-to-day -day basis, are subtle and require focused attention to be able to perceive what's going on around me. When I drive in my automobile, where I live in a little town called Ojai to Ventura or Santa Barbara through this gorgeous area of California, it still looks beautiful. There's still all these undeveloped fields uh, outside of my home. But then if I look really closely, there's no bugs hitting the windshield anymore because the insects have plummeted. Probably because of industrial agriculture and the host and basket of other human development all around me. Or when I go into my yard and listen carefully uh, during the migration season, uh, the sounds of the birds have changed. There's not as many species of birds uh, around where I live anymore. If I go into the ocean and go surfing uh, or going diving, I can see the changes that have happened in my own lifetime. I can walk out into the surf break and see that there aren't octopuses anymore under the rocks or these little creatures called nudibranchs that used to be all over the tidewater pools. They're gone. So these things, maybe they're not subtle. Uh, they don't seem subtle to me. And they, in aggregate, create a concern that can be called uh, fear for our future. Uh, so imagine witnessing geological change on the planet during human time frame. Uh, I went back to uh, a mountain range in China that I first visited in 1980, uh, a little while ago, and I couldn't even recognize the places where we had been. Uh, not that many years ago because the glaciers had retreated uh, so significantly. You know, even trying to find the route we had taken up a mountain was a challenge because it looks so different. People sometimes ask me, what's your favorite climb in the world? And I can answer by saying, uh, my favorite climb in the world was a route called the Ice Window on Mount Kenya. It was magical. It was this ribbon of ice going up this peak, literally right on the equator, where on the approach to the mountain, I saw herds of elephants with glacial ice as the backdrop. And then ascending this route up this ribbon of ice, just below the top, you entered behind a curtain of ice, crawled up inside the mountain and chopped your way out, and you were on the summit. It was a, a magical route that is magically and tragically gone forever, melted, disappeared in my own lifetime. My favorite climb is gone and, and it will be probably tens of thousands of years before it comes back. As a climber, uh, a mountaineer, uh, as you might imagine, I've had close calls. Uh, I've actually had a couple that have been extremely close. Uh, the first, I think, was in 1980 on the side of a remote mountain in eastern Tibet with uh, my good friend Yvonne Chouinard and also another close friend of mine, um, Jonathan Wright. We were caught in an avalanche and swept down the side of this peak, uh, nearly 2,000 uh, vertical feet. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, somehow I, I had survived without too serious of injury. Um, Yvonne had a concussion and some broken ribs and our other really close companion, uh, Jonathan, uh, was severely injured and uh, eventually he died while I was you know, holding him in, in my arms and, and we buried him uh, on the side of that uh, peak uh, and went home. And for the next two years I uh, stopped climbing. Uh, I really put a pause on uh, my adventuring because it was now so clear to me uh, what the potential consequences were. 
But as I emerged from that time, I realized that I was emerging with a lot of strengths that I didn't realize I, I had uh, going into it. And uh, at the end, I understood better that famous story about Dostoevsky when he was sentenced to die by firing squad and the captain put the bandana around his head and then Dostoevsky heard the firing squad ready, aim, and then he heard all the rifles go off and nothing happened. And the captain pulled off the blindfold and said, that was your punishment. And for him, it wasn't punishment, but it was rebirth. He thought he was dead. And he was reborn into a, a new life with new commitments. And so I started to realize I was going through the same process. Uh, and I went back to climbing and mountaineering uh, and adventuring, uh, looking at it through a different set of eyes and also beginning this long, lifelong process of uh, commitment to more than just uh, going into these uh, wild places for some sort of, uh, you know, p personal goal. Uh, that became less and less important as over time my uh, commitment to conservation and environmentalism uh, emerged uh, as well. So I continued to pursue uh, uh, the outdoors and, and, and the wildness, but, but again, through a little, a little different uh, lens. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, my most recent encounter was not a year ago. Uh, it was only now, <laughs> seems like a lifetime, but it's only been 11 months since, uh, you know, I was in a, a double kayak with Doug Tompkins and uh, we got caught in a windstorm in, in Patagonia, the place, southern cone of South America, and our boat flipped in really ice cold water. We were in that water for quite a long time. And uh, I was in it long enough that I was unconscious by the time my colleagues pulled me ashore and built a fire and plopped me in front of it and I, I survived. But uh, Doug, who was in the water for a little longer than me, died. And, you know, so there's not a day since then that many times during the day, including today, that uh, the image of the two of us in the water doesn't come back to me. And when I see him there, and uh, we both knew that it might be the end for us, uh, we've been in those situations enough to know the straits that we were in. Um, and to think that somehow I came through that and he didn't, uh, it requires a renewed commitment every single day to do everything you can, everything I can, everything any of us can as individuals, to live as fully as we can, to live responsibly, to live with, with commitment. So whatever days I have left on this planet, each one is a privilege, uh, and each one I vow to use my very best to get the most out of, uh, and to help all of us as human beings through this mess that we've created ourselves because we're smart enough to, to get out of it. There are two areas of my work that actually provide hope, that actually allow me to get up in the morning and stretch my arms and say, we may be able to see our ways through this. Most of my effort now is uh, in partnership with uh, Chris Tompkins and uh, Tompkins Conservation and the work that she and her husband uh, Doug uh, did. Uh, her work to conserve uh, several big areas of wilderness in the southern cone of South America and with the time that I do have uh, available I um, want to spend as much of it as I can uh, advancing uh, their vision. Saving what's left of the wild planets uh, wild places on our planet. I believe, as Dr. E.O. Wilson has said recently uh, in his celebrated book, Half Earth, that if we human beings can agree to set aside half of the planet for conservation, for our brethren wildlife, then that wildlife has a, a hope of, uh, of making it through the sixth extinction crisis. A more technical 
effort that we're making at the company I work with, Patagonia, where just recently uh, we've moved the company and extended our brand from apparel to food, all sourced with ingredients that are not just organic and not just sustainable, but as much as possible are produced from farming and ranching techniques that are called regenerative. And they're called regenerative because they regenerate the health of the soils that have been killed, that are often dead as a consequence of industrial agricultural practices. Scientists can now extrapolate what would happen if a significant amount of farming and ranching converted to these practices. Because the amount of carbon being pulled in the soil has been measured, we can now extrapolate those numbers. And here's the answer, that if somewhere between 50 to maybe at the most half of farming and grazing on planet Earth were to convert to these practices, it would pull enough carbon out of the air to get us back to pre-industrial carbon levels. It would pull us down to about 290 parts per million atmospheric carbon. And that would solve climate change. So there are solutions. There are ways that we human beings uh, can use our ingenuity to get us out of this trap that we've built for ourselves. We just have to have the collective will to do it. But what we're not sure about is how tenable any business model is in a future economy whose underpinning has been removed, at least as business is as usual is being practiced on planet Earth now, when there's no longer any growth on a global basis. What's that look like? Well, as we think that one through, then the only conclusion we can come to is that we're going to have to, as human beings, redefine our relationship with work. We're going to have to redefine what we do with our time. And we think there's plenty of opportunities to re-engineer that ground up. We also believe at the end of the day, the biggest opportunity for us is to get away from consumables, to get away from consumption, to get away from buying so much more than we need, to buy just what we need to get by, and to use our time for those things that do less harm to the earth that actually are essential to our well-being. And therein lies Patagonia's new foray into food. Because we believe the answer to a re-engineered global economy, the secret of it, is in a re-engineered, a rethought out a repurposed way of engaging in food production. That's what we should be spending most of our time, not making a bunch of stuff that we don't need.